All right, so um, the past the academic quarter now. So um, we'll start the last session of the day with Philip Maciejewski, um, and who's talking, who's been talking about operational quantum average case distances. Philip. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so, yeah, first of all, of course, thanks to the organizers for uh, making all of this possible and uh, thanks to all of you for sticking around for the last session on Friday. Uh, it's appreciated. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about a joint project uh, that we did with uh, Zbyszek Puchała and Michał Szmaniec, uh, both from Poland. Uh, and it's going to be about a particular type of distance measures between quantum objects that we were uh, considering. So uh, I will start by just uh, recalling what are the commonly used distance measures and what do they mean uh, physically. And then uh, I go to, to the distance measures that we proposed with uh, a bunch of like kind of conceptual conceptual points uh not a lot of math i suppose uh so the motivation is uh kind of straightforward uh to to introduce uh, uh to to consider uh distances between quantum objects so by quantum objects i mean uh states measurements and channels and uh, usually uh you can uh, you can think about this uh kind of from two perspectives, like uh, why the distance are useful. So uh, one kind of practical perspective is, uh, well, you have a quantum device and you want to ask how well your, your state is implemented. So you want some distance measure to, to compare it uh, with. Uh, and from fundamental perspective, as uh, you probably all know, like if you have some two quantum states uh, that are not orthogonal, you will not have the ability to perfectly distinguish between them, so you can ask uh, how well you can how well you can do this uh, uh, in principle. So, like, uh, what are the optimal uh, strategies to to distinguish between states? Uh, and so, I'm talking mostly about states here, but like everything uh, I will talk about generalizes to measurements and channels. Uh, uh, so, just keep that in mind. Uh, Okay, so the usual approach to uh, to approach this question, how well can we distinguish between two quantum states uh, in principle, uh, is phrased in terms of this uh, states discrimination game. So we have a promise that our device produces state rho or sigma with equal probability. And then, uh, well, if we have, uh, you know, a quantum device, what we can do with a state, we can measure it. And essentially, what uh, so we get some classical outcome, and uh, what quantum devices give us access to is uh, just a sample from some probability distribution. This is like a probability vector from Born's rule. So uh, if we have a state row, then the samples will be coming from uh, from this probability distribution, and if sigma, it's from this. So what we essentially have is that this task of uh, distinguishing between states. Um, reduces to, to the classical task of distinguishing between probability distributions. Uh, so let me call this probability distribution uh, like this with index rho, this with index sigma. And uh, the success probability uh, of the discrimination is proportional to the total variation distance between the two probability distributions. So this tells you how, how well you can do. And uh, well, the question uh, is how well you can do this in principle. So uh, what you want to do is devise an optimal strategy. Uh, therefore, you can uh, here, you can just maximize over measurements. And basically, uh, what is well known, it uh, turns out that this uh, like optimal success rate of uh, distinguishing between the two states uh, is given by a uh, uh, is proportional to the trace distance between those uh, those states. Uh, so this is how you uh, approach like a kind of um, operational definition of uh, standard distances. Uh, standard, I mean the trace distance. Uh, and uh, what does it mean uh, like uh, physically? So again, those are like kind of two viewpoints uh, that I uh, that we 
uh, that we adopt. So first is like assessing quality of a device. So you imagine that, uh, for, for example, RAW is your target state, ideal state that you want, uh, would like to implement. And Sigma is some noisy state that is actually implemented in a device. Uh, so since you have those two states and uh, uh, one of them is what you want to do and one, one is what is actually happening. And here you optimize over all of the measurements. So you kind of put it, uh, put the states in the worst possible scenario. So this means that from the practical perspective, if you calculate the trace distance between states, uh, this tells you kind of how, uh, how bad your device performs uh, in principle in the worst possible scenario, you know, because this is like optimized over all measurements that you can perform. Uh, and from this fundamental perspective, like uh, of just optimal distinguishability protocols, well, I mean, it just tells you how well you can distinguish them. So it's like just you have some two states and you ask a question like, uh, in principle, uh, how well you can distinguish them. Uh, so, um, so if you would like, uh, so one thing you can, uh, like one can notice is that, uh, well, in general, if you have like, uh, uh, some optimization, uh, those protocols might be potentially hard to implement. Uh, so this is kind of like the usual approach, meaning this is like a, uh, one way to, to think about those, uh, let's say, uh, popular distance measures. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is the, the one for, uh, for states that I talked about. And uh, if you want to consider other objects and states like measurements and, uh, and general channels, uh, you have like fully analogous games so uh, and corresponding distances. So if you have POVMs, quantum measurements, you uh, you have this game where you have either this measurement or this, M or N, and uh, you put in some state. So you can optimize over states and this gives you some type of a distance uh, between measurements. And for channels, so uh, for channels, people usually talk more about like um, also adding some ancillary system where you uh, don't do anything and your channel acts only on a half of the Hilbert space, and then you can use entanglement to boost up a little bit this uh, distinguishing probability. So this is uh, the corresponding norm where you optimize over both st uh, like input states to the channel and the measurements that you perform after the channel. Uh, the corresponding distance is so-called uh, diamond uh, norm distance. Uh, so this is like, uh, let's say, usual approach. Uh, which corresponds to those types of distances that I just uh, briefly described. And uh, in our work, uh, we consider not uh, kind of the worst case uh, scenarios, uh, not optimal scenarios, but average case scenarios where the average is uh, just like using random quantum circuits. Uh, and uh, the motivation behind this is like uh, that maybe it's better suited for like uh, NIST devices in a sense that it quantifies uh, average behavior as opposed to like this worst case uh, optimization that you have uh, and also like uh, potentially there is like a recently quite a lot of interest in uh, randomized protocols and uh, in in principle maybe it could be easier to to implement those uh, distinguished protocols uh yeah so now we change the question uh, a little bit so we don't ask how well you can distinguish between two states is uh like in principle but you ask how well you can do that using random circuits uh, and the setting is the following so again you have this game uh, you want to distinguish between two states uh, and you make a measurement at the end and now we set this measurement to be a computational basis uh, but before it we apply a random uh, unitary drawn from some measure new uh, you can think about hard measure uh, for now, but like in general, oh, I'll be talking about holds also for just random local quantum circuits. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, I mean, we can basically just play the same game again. Uh, I can call this uh, this new, pro this is a priority vector that we can uh, sample from, like also we sample over the unitaries. And then what we can consider is uh, average total variation distance uh, over those unitaries as opposed to like maximization that was previously there. Uh, and the question is uh, uh, how, how one can calculate this. Uh, so uh, in general, uh, averages uh, are often like kind of easily calculate, uh, uh, calculated if you is drawn from hard measure, uh, if you can use some like uh, hard measure integra integration techniques. 
uh, but this is the case if the underlying functions of, uh, so this, uh, that you want to calculate are polynomials uh, in this priorities, but here it's like absolute value. So it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, troublesome, but fortunately uh, there is a solution uh, to that, uh, which is uh, not exact, but, uh, but approximate. So, uh, so basically, uh, so what I mean by approximate is that we can actually bound this uh, from above and from below. Uh, okay, so we have this quantity and basically we can bound it from uh, above by some functions of the states. I will make it explicit in a moment. Uh, and like to do this, you basically just use a simple uh, Jensen's inequality. Uh, and uh, to, to obtain a lower bound, uh, you use so-called uh, Berger's inequality uh, that is written uh, in the right top corner. Uh, and this was uh, this lower bound was uh, pointed out uh, in the uh, Ambainis and Emerson paper from 2007 in this context of discrimination of quantum states. Uh, which was kind of like an inspiration for all of this research. Uh, yeah, so basically what you can do, uh, the, the point here is that you can have an upper bound and lower bound with the same function of the states, but just differing by a constant. So it's like a uh, relative error approximation to this quantity. Uh, and this function turns out to be just a Hilbert Schmidt distance between uh, quantum states. So this gives you interpretation of, this, of the distance as like a, uh, as a uh, measure of how well you can distinguish between two states using uh, using random circuits. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so I already mentioned this, but like uh, the like kind of from practical perspective, what is important is that those uh, those unit tests are like uh, it suffices for them to be approximate for the designs. So. Uh, this uh, you can think basically about like just local quantum circuits uh, of there are some constructions that use just like uh, o n depth that can achieve uh, this property um so what does this uh, uh, so uh, what does this type of distance therefore uh, like mean physically so it means that hilbert schmidt's distance uh if you look at it from this practical perspective of comparing how well your uh, like implementation performs compared to the ideal one, it tells you how it how well it performs on average over random circuits. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, from this fundamental perspective that asks question how well you can distinguish between states uh, with random circuits, it uh, well tells you that maybe you can use randomized protocols that can be uh, can be easy to implement. Uh, Possibly. Uh, so maybe what's worth stressing here is that uh, if we can calculate this uh, Hilbert Schmidt distance, it's like doesn't tell us the protocol how to distinguish between those two states. It's just like a theoret like information theoretical statement that you can do this using random circuit, but we don't have to know why uh, how. Uh, yeah, and uh, from again from practical perspective, maybe what's uh, Especially interesting is that like uh, that you can uh, think about those random unitaries as just like uh, uh, that they have structure of variational circuits. Uh, so currently, it is widely believed that like normal uh, the uh, standard architectures for variational circuits do have those uh, uh, approximate design properties, which is also confirmed by numerics. Uh, so it uh, it kind of uh, yeah kind of can tell you about uh, average performance when the unitaries are just random variational circuits. Um, yeah. So uh, okay. So this was for states, and uh, I told you that we can uh, we can think about those uh, those averages uh, uh, to to uh, like uh, and approximate them by some by explicit function of states, which is uh, just a Hilbert Schmidt distance. And we have like fully analogous games for uh, for POVMs, where now your uh, your input uh, state is fixed, and you want to distinguish between POVMs M and N, and uh, you apply a unitary uh, before the measurement or after the state, whatever you prefer, uh, state preparation. And uh, in terms of uh, channels, uh, again you kind of have like uh, inputs and outputs um, to channels, so you apply a random unitary before and independently after. And uh, 
basically like so you take uh, in this case you have like two averages uh, and the point is that like uh, for all of those objects as for states you can derive like explicit approximations for those uh, for those averages which are simple functions uh, so in in the case of states i already told about this uh, uh, and for measurements it's a little bit more complicated uh, function but <clears throat> again you have like a hilbert schmidt uh, appearing there which is now uh, like a difference between measurement operators and also you have kind of a part that checks how much the traces differ between this, uh, those uh, operators uh, and for channels uh, also similar expression. First one is kind of um, just like a Hilbert Schmidt distance between choice, the choice representations of, of these channels. And uh, the second part uh, tells you, uh, okay, so this tau d, uh, so I didn't define it, it's just a maximally mixed state. So it tells you kind of like uh, how, uh, uh, it tells you something about the unitality of this channel, so how they preserve the, the, the maximum mixed state. If they both preserve it, then this other times is zero. So for unital channels, it's just a Hilbert Schmidt distance between choice. Um, yeah. So uh, now about uh, applications. Uh, well, what I, I personally I liked about uh, this stuff is that uh, if you can actually calculate those distances between some quantum objects, then they kind of gives you. Uh, easy access to some insights about how how uh, like those protocols can perform so basically for for example from this fundamental perspective you can uh, if you have a high average case distance between objects some two quantum objects uh, then this means that random circuits can in principle distinguish them well and this uh, this is the case for example when you want to distinguish any pure states uh, and the maximal mixed state so you know you have some uh, some pure state and there you have like a, a, a noise complete noise you want to distinguish between this and uh, the distance in this case is basically like uh, uh, a constant uh, so like one over this one over the dimension of the Hilbert space uh, so this uh, this is uh, they are far away uh, so this means that they can be distinguished uh, and uh, very similar scenario for unitary channel and maximally depolarizing channel so uh, in this case, it even faster converges to a constant. Um, and uh, from practical perspective, uh, you can think about quantum advantage, where people often um, do like random sampling uh, experiments, like Google, for example. Uh, so if you have high average case distance between noisy, uh, uh, noisy implementation and target implementation, or uh, you can also think kind of in a dual way. Uh, you can think about a distance between a noisy, uh, uh, your noisy, I don't know, state measurement or something, and a trivial distribution. So you can also like use our distances to to to, to bound that. Uh, so if it's small, so it means that on average it will be close to the trivial distribution. So it might also tell you that perhaps it might not uh, be, uh, be not be so useful. Uh, so this uh, this might mean that it will perform, but on average over those uh, those random circuits. Uh, and examples are, for example, if you have a, like an identity channel and just a single qubit, like point Pauli error. So this means that like you have two layers of random circuits, and um, in the middle uh, you have like a single Pauli matrix. It turns out that this distance just breaks uh, and. Uh, and it's constant so it tells you that if you have like a, a random uh, unitary uh, and then uh, some single qubit Pauli error <coughs> sorry and then another random unitary so kind of like a, uh, some Pauli error inside the, um, uh, between layers let's say um, then then it breaks your uh, average distribution <coughs> um, and um, a little bit similar thing holds for when you have a computational basis measurement and some uncorrelated stochastic noise. So you have, <coughs> uh, excuse me. Um, so you have some like uh, multi qubit arbitrary state, then you have a, 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 random, a random unitary, and you assume all of this is perfect, except when you make a measurement in standard basis, you add some, uh, some noise. Uh, which is uh, represented by those lambda channels. They don't have to be the same. 
Uh, so in that case, you can lower bound the distance between those two guys. Uh, okay, this is uh, a little bit more complicated, complicated expression. So, but you, basically, what you have there is uh, one uh, number one minus some uh, uh, some small number to the power of n and plus some small number to the power of n. So uh, where n is the number of qubits, and uh, the small number is uh, like kind of average error probability for each qubit, and this is like. Uh, routinely reported in those quantum uh, advantage experiments so i can just plug in like actual numbers from from those experiments uh, and i can get that uh, for like uh, 50 something qubits for google and uh, uh, to okay i don't know how to phrase uh, uh, say that but it's like this chinese uh, quantum device you will have that <clears throat> even without any other types of noise this uh, you are your average total like total variation distance will be lower bounded by <coughs> by this number from ideal distribution of your noisy distribution. So only if you have measurement noise. Uh, all right. So just to finish, uh, a few plots uh, uh, from numerics. Um, <coughs> so uh, so what we have here is like on y-axis is a uh, one one of types of distances, the uh, x-axis is the number of qubits, and now the the black uh, top uh, curve is a trace distance between between some. Uh, okay, in this case, it's just like a um, separable Paul, uh, like Pauli eigenstate, like uh, randomly chosen on each qubit, and uh, separable like a random generic Pauli noise. So this means that with some properties you apply some of the Pauli matrices. So like uh, not just like point error, but generic Pauli noise. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so you, so, you have, uh, so this is trace distance. So this is an upper bound that comes from those, uh, from those uh, average case distances. This is lower bound. And what you have here are like data points that uh, we got like numerically uh, by just like explicitly calculating those um, mean total variation distances over unit arrays, which were taken to be just a random uh, variational circuits. Uh, and uh, one was like taken to be, uh, to have a structure of like QAA, if you're familiar with this, and the other VQ. Um, so, I mean, so basically what this graph says that uh, for in this example, you, well, I mean, uh, the trace distance might kind of like seriously overestimate the, the effects of errors uh, in on average, which is uh, maybe not that surprising. And similar uh, similar stuff for uh, for POVMs. So in this uh, like curves mean the same, but uh, now the POVMs are like you compare the computational basis with some tomographic reconstruction of um, IBM POVMs that we did in experiments. So this is like, I mean, uh, the POVMs taken are like experimental, but uh, the rest of it is just numerical results. Uh, and also uh, and also for, uh, well, just similar stuff uh, for, for channels. Uh, okay, so uh, just to summarize, uh, what I talked about is that uh, those commonly used di distance measures, like trace distance between states, diamond distance between channels, and also corresponding uh, distance for measurements, tell you how bad your device can perform in principle. And here we considered like average case distances based on random quantum circuits. Uh, all of them are simple functions of the underlying objects uh, and potentially better suited for assessing performance of NIST devices. Uh, and they have some like applications to various problems like those uh, quantum advantage experiments based on random circuits where you can just calculate those distances for some toy noise models. Uh, all right, that's uh, almost all. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, similar to Dan on the previous session, uh, we are, uh, you know, our boss is hiring. So if you'd like to work on some NISP uh, things, then uh, feel free to, to contact him. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Philip, for a very interesting talk. Uh, we have time for um, a question. Yes.
Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so I have a comment and a question. Okay. <laughs> My comment is that I think another application of this distance could be in cryptography because that, as far as I know, that's the only thing that could be used and it makes a distinction between average case adversarial scenarios and mm -hmm. uh, worst case adversarial scenario. So I think maybe... Yeah, I see. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. About. I know almost nothing about cryptography, so this is legit. <laughs> because that's, that's another place that usually you care about, like... The distinguishing between sure. quantum states so that's that's one comment uh, and my question was that do you think also it can have application in um like be, being combined with a classical shadow technique uh, you know i don't know if you're fine yeah yeah i mean like no it, sure i mean it, it does like kind of uh uh i would suspect it uh, might uh, kind of directly uh so well i mean if you consider a um a global Clifford ensemble in that mm -hmm. case, then it's uh, okay. So the, uh, we needed four designs, uh, Cliffords or not. But uh, as far as I remember, actually for Cliff, uh, like they actually do fulfill the exact conditions that we need anyway for those bumps to hold. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I think this would yeah, it would co also could uh, like you could also think about those unitaries just coming from the shadow protocol. I mm -hmm. suppose yeah. Okay. Oh. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, one of the slides you recommend to use uh, Hilbert Schmidt norm distance for uh, discriminate two states. Uh, 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 could you please repeat? Like, uh... Uh, uh, one of the slides you recommend to use yes. Hilbert Schmidt. To ah, discuss. yes, 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 exactly. Yeah, uh, for discriminate to state. Uh, yes. However, I have some um, problem about that because uh, uh, the Hilbert Schmidt distance is not uh, non no, no, not non increasing. Yes, for yes. TCP. Trace preserve. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, completely possible. Indeed. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, in some um, time, uh, there's some debate about that uh, for use of the Hilbert Schmidt distance for uh, entanglement measure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the conclusion is that it's not suitable to use Hilbert Schmidt distance for uh, define the entanglement measure. Uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, uh, how do you think about this problem? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. Of course, you're right. So, uh, uh, Hilbert Schmidt distance and all of our average case distances, they are uh, non increasing after under like unital channels, uh, unital channels, sorry, uh, but not like um, generic channels. Uh, but, uh, well, I mean, so I think that uh, kind of argumentation. Uh, that opposes that uh, comes uh, from this uh, way of thinking about optimal protocols. And uh, well, I mean, if you are considering the best thing you can do, then indeed you wouldn't like want to have this. Uh, 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 you wouldn't have uh, this uh, problem. Want to have this problem? But I mean, if you are considering something that is uh, not optimal but uh, still good, that I, I don't think that. Uh, well, I mean, for, I uh, I don't know why not use that in that case. Like, so it, just to accept that this is not an optimal solution, uh, just like uh, uh, just something good that you can do and potentially maybe do it easier. Uh, but yeah, uh, so exactly. Yes, yes. That's how I would think about this. Uh, Okay, great. If there are no further questions, let's thank the speaker again. Hi, um, so my name is Akihiro Soeda. I'm from National Institute of Informatics. Obviously, that's in Japan, if you just haven't figured that out yet. Uh, so, um, but this, thank you all of you for coming here, and I thank the organizers for, uh, um, uh, you know, organizing this uh, conference. So, um, so I'll just go ahead and start talking what we mean by encoders. So encoding, we mean by say you have a one qubit, you want to represent that using in a larger system, say n qubits, right? And then of course you can, as you know, you can implement that by uh, using uh,
you can implement that by uh, using some unitary. So you have this, uh, you know, uh, uh, input uh, state of, of little d dimension and encode that using some unitary and make that into, you know, uh, capital D large, larger dimension. And then if you have uh, one of the things, uh, one of the key defining features of, of encoding operation is that you have decoding operation that can be done deterministically. And we see this sort of uh, encoding and decoding process uh, in, in, in many various uh, scenarios. And one of them, just, just name a few, right? Just, of course, you can, this is one, one key com subcomponent of, of uh, many quantum algorithms. And, uh, and, and some people actually use this to understand uh, quantum gravity. Okay. I'm not going to go into detail of quantum gravity because I'm not, that's far from my expertise, but I'll just say that it's, they appear um, uh, in various settings. Okay, so, uh, so, so suppose you have a, uh, okay, okay, before that. So as you can see in these slides, right, uh, in, in, on this slide, uh, the encoding and, and, uh, and, and decoding uh, process are sort of, uh, uh, they, they utilize the fact that you know how the encoding is done. So in, in, in this particular scenario, in the encoding, it's given by a sequence of uh, circuit and uh, quantum gates, but then you basically reverse that sequence and to, to, to realize the decoding operation. But what if you don't know how your encoding box is, uh, is created? You know, and um, so I understand there are many, uh, many people from the industry and they might not really want to disclose how, you, how your encoding process is done. You know, it might, might be appropriate. Right? Of course, um, if, you're, if you have access to this encoding black box and, uh, several times, you can do, say, process tomography to, uh, to, to reveal the, the identity of your uh, black box. Uh, however, um, uh, tomography is very costly. At least uh, it's uh, the number of samples you need to, uh, to achieve, some, to achieve yeah, uh, some tomography of, of epsilon, error epsilon is, is polynomial in, in the little d, the input dimension, and, and capital D. Uh, Large dimension, uh, the output dimension, which means that if, even if you're uh, just encoding one qubit, if you're encoding down to n qubit, then you already need the two to n power uh, samples. So in this case, uh, uh, so to, to overcome this, we uh, utilize uh, some of the things, some of the stuff we have been done in the past, uh, which we call higher order quantum transformation. Uh, I, I'll explain more of this in detail, but in what we achieve basically is that um, uh, we were able to get rid of this uh, capital D dimension. Uh, you have a little dimension uh, dependence in, in the sample complexity. So what do we mean? What, what we mean? What we mean? What we mean by a uh, high order quantum, trans, quantum transformation is something like this. So we, uh, so this is uh, so the so so in green we have a uh, uh, the the input operation that we would like to convert. So this would be the encoding box box in the in in our particular scenario. Then we use this as as one uh, like component and construct a larger circuit. So the, the purple ones are uh, uh, the, 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 the transforming uh, uh, circuit, uh, which would be independent of the input. So you might say this is an input agnostic uh, implementation of this, of this decoding operation implementation. And ideally, um, you might just, uh, so what, what you might ask that, uh, so well, we want to achieve this using just one call, single call of the input operation, and they make it exact and deterministic. This would be ideal. But uh, uh, usually, so if you demand so much, then you, most things are impossible. So we, we will uh, relax this. So uh, uh, there are many, many ways to do this, but uh, one particular uh, re relaxation we chose was to keep the exactness, but allow uh, multiple calls and make it prob prob uh, prob probabilistic. And in this case, uh, one feature of merit is to see how the success probability increases as you uh, allow yourself uh, more uh, calls to the, you know, of the input operation. So it's, the society would be like this. So, uh, it's, uh, we've added that uh, in the measurement to, and then uh, to make things, uh, to, to give us more uh, uh, transformation power. And the, the measurement result will tell you whether it does, does that uh, transformation succeed or fail. And then this will succeed, uh, so this P would be the success probability. Right. Uh, so if you have a, uh, if you use uh, multiple uh, calls of the input uh, transformation, you can use it in parallel. So this be, uh, or in sequential. Sequential is more powerful in the in the, the kind of of uh, transformation you can do. But then it means that you need to wait for uh, the all these intermediate uh, circuits to come in. So this would increase the depth. Uh, whereas uh, if you can do it parallel, you would uh, decrease in the, the in the kinds of transformation you can do. But then you you, you uh, Increase in the in the concurrence, so it, you might be able to uh, uh, apply all these uh, input uh, calls, uh, input operations simultaneously in principle. 
And by the way, uh, you can go to indefinite calls or whatever. We have we have some results on that too, but then I'm not going to discuss in this in this presentation for uh, for the interest of time. Okay, so let's uh, so let's, let us define our, our question more uh, more formally. So so we're given k copies of block post isometry uh, given by some operation from a little d dimension to large d, d dimension and use that k times and this thick wire. If you so if you see a, a thicker wire, then it, it's it corresponds to larger dimension of, of capital D, and, and then and the task is to implement the inverse uh, operation defined such that it, uh, uh, if you apply these two channels, then you go back to the identity operation on the small D dimension system, and then and if you want the um, uh, if you want a, a circuit description of, of the problem, and this would be it. Okay. Right. Actually, uh, we already have some re partial results on this uh, is uh, isometry inversion, namely uni unitary inversion. So unitary is uh, a particular example of, of isometry where the, the in input dimension and the output dimension are the same, so little d equals large d. Uh, so in that case, we already have results in back in 2019 where the, where the success probability is given by this quantity. Right. So how we did that was uh, we... Uh, uh, broke, uh, bro uh, so, so, so we broke down uh, uh, unitary inversion into two steps uh, because inversion of the unitary is given by a, a conjugate transpose. So that's uh, doing complex, tra complex conjugation and doing uh, uh, transposition on the un unitary. So for, for the uh, complex conjugation part, we, uh, we, had, uh, 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 we knew how to do this uh, back in 2019. So this is a paper from another... Uh, just another, another people we have in, in the past, and basically, so this uses uh, uh, so d minus one calls of, of of the input unitary, and it achieves the uh, this, uh, the, the complex conjugation. What's important here is that this, uh, if you want to the exact uh, transformation, no matter how small the probability, you need d minus one calls. You cannot do any, any smaller than this. By the way, uh, if you're a more uh, uh, if you're very uh, if you're used to this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this representations here on, on unitary transform transformations, then uh, this transformation is basically going from uh, 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 achieving this uh, 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 the conjugate representation using anti-symmetric subspace. Okay, now for the, for the transposition. Um, so one of the simplest ways to, to, to do this uh, uh, unitary transposition is to use, actually in fact, use a uh, uh, gate teleportation, which is basically a combination of teleportation and applying unitary. So this uh, first part of the, uh, of the, of the circuit achieves, uh, it's, it's, it's in fact equal to as if you've applied a transposition on uh, yeah, the, the, the transpose unitary on the, on the lower part of the, of the uh, maximum entangled state. And if you want to increase the probability by using more multiple, uh, by using um, more input, uh, more by using the, the input operations and you know, operations more times, then you can use uh, port based teleportation. I'm not going to the detail, but uh, the point is that, uh, that this is the probabilistic uh, exact implementation, and uh, uh, you can uh, the, and then the uh, success probability increases as you increase the number of unitaries. Yeah, so if you combine those, you get something like this. So, so you, so, so in green, uh, you have you the the the, the, the stuff covering cover in green achieves the, the, the complex conjugation of the unitary, the input unitary, and the 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 and the, and the, 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 the stuff covering and the purple line achieves the uh, uh, transposition using port based propagation. Now, and it, I, you don't need to know all the details. Basically, what's important here is that you, you can, if you prepare some state, which we call phi, and then do some operation, which we call uh, d tilde, then you can achieve this uh, uh, unitary inversion. Yeah, so this is, again, the same thing. Uh, but if you, can, if, you, if you know how to do this uh, uh, inversion for unitary, then why can't you just apply that for uh, you know the isometry because after all isometry is done by you know this big unitary but then again if you do that um the number of calls that you at least need is again d minus one capital d minus one but this this constraint comes from factor using you're using a complex conjugate of unitary so again so so we want to we want to get rid of the dependence on on the capital d but but, but we can't do that if you view isometry as as an as an embedded uh unitary yes so now, uh, so, so, now, so, uh, so we go. So, but then we couldn't actually uh, uh, generalize uh, the the complex conjugation and the transposition to isometry in general. And uh, and then, first of all, uh,
Yes. First of all, we found out that uh, if you, you cannot do a probability asymmetric complex conjugation when uh, the the capital D is is, is bigger than two times uh, little d. This is because uh, asymmetry includes basically just adding an extra ancilla. This so if you have input uh, quantum state that you want to encode, but so, so adding just extra ancilla can account as as as, as, as an asymmetry. And then if you can do complex conjugation of, of this isometry, you can then that, that implies you're, you're doing uh, complex conjugation on the on this ancilla state. But we already know uh, from some results from some from some some other people that if you can that it's impossible to do prob probabilistic uh, uh, complex conjug conjugation of states. So uh, if you get so again, so the the message the message is that if you can do probabilistic isometry. Probabilistic isometry complex conjugation that implies that you can do a probabilistic state complex conjugation, which is known to be impossible. So two, it just comes from the fact that if you does the smallest uh, dimension of the ancilla that I can have is two, the qubit, right? That's the smallest thing you can have. Yeah. So this is the result that was that uh, talks about impos impossibility of state complex conjugation, and uh, um, and again, and for uh, uh, for transposition, uh, you still can do. Uh, uh, probabilistic uh, transposition using, again, uh, port-based teleportation. But then again, uh, you still have this uh, uh, capital D dependence. OK, so now how did, how did we get rid of the capital D dependence? So the most important part is that uh, we've int we found that we can, you can do the some, some, something, some new uh, map that we call a, a, psi, a capital Psi tilde. And what it does is that if you uh, have a, uh, your, your input asymmetry uh, lined up in parallel like this, and then apply this psi tilde. That gives the same uh, effect as as if you have a, a little uh, a unit of a little d dimension, and 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 then uh, done in a probabilistic way. So uh, on on the right on the left, you have some uh, explicit explicit dependence on uh, capital V. That's your, that's uh, that's the, that's your input asymmetry operation. But on the on the right hand side, you no longer have this capital V de dependence. Okay, and also uh, capital D dependence have uh, has disappeared. Okay. So how do we use that? So um, so we insert. So we start from the uh, the uh, unitary inversion uh, uh, protocol. So that's the psi, uh, phi and uh, uh, tilde D that we uh, that I mentioned uh, a couple of slides ago, and, and in, you insert this uh, psi tilde in here. So why does why does this work? So, well, let's see uh, when in, in this particular scenario when this this uh, row sub in is equal to uh, row applied uh, uh, on on which you, you apply D. So like this. So if you look at the the, the middle part, right? Uh, you, you use the the the, the Previous lemma that we that, that we dis described, then this part uh, changes to uh, uh, basically a parallel apl application of, of UD with some uh, stochastic. Uh, uh, you, you take a, a stochastic mixture. So, and if you, the, the the middle part it actually does a, a unitary inversion. So basically, what you, so no matter what the U is, this this whole thing uh, achieves a, a unitary inversion on on this uh, on on on. On this role and UD, so you, you you get back the original role. So I hope this convinces that uh, 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 this circuit, in fact, uh, successfully implements uh, uh, isometry inversion. Yes. Now there are, there um, so if you're just interested in how to implement this isometry inversion, then then basically you can stop listening to to me right now. But then uh, so, there, so there are uh, um, there were. Several mathematical techniques we need to implement in, in order to discover this. This uh, so, which means uh, which which forced us to uh, sort of uh, go beyond this typical Schrödinger duality. If you're interested, you can, uh, you can ask me more about this. So, yeah. So the summary is this. So um, first of all, we uh, set up to, uh, uh, to understand how we can do this isometry inversion with uh, with without any dependence on a capital D. And we've done that. And then, and then uh, along the way, we've uh, discovered a few uh, interesting properties about asymmetry that are, that's not present in uh, unitaries. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Akita. Uh, maybe a quick question. Um, it's a bit short on time, yeah, Ross. Sorry. 
I just wanted to check that I understood properly. The protocol is probabilistic but exact. Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yes, that's very important. So thanks for confirming that. <laughs> All right, let's thank the speaker thank again. You. Yeah, hi everyone. So today I'm going to talk about um, this. And uh, this is a uh, extension of some work I did in my master's thesis with um, Stefano Gordioso and uh, I know I know um, a lot of you came here for quantum information so um, this uh, but today I'm going to talk about um, quantum compilation on circuit compilation but by promise this is going to be it's going to be very simple so so if you just bear with me 10 minutes you're gonna you're gonna understand all of it um, so so this is a top topologically aware optimization technique for circuits and using mixed phase gadgets, I'm going to explain what they are in a moment by conjugating by layers of CNOTs and using simulating leading technique. Um, so this this will be this is a this is this is mainly of um, interest for um, variational problems and also, but the library we we, we implemented um, is also interesting for the, in the fault tolerant case. So what what is a phase gadget? Well, um, a phase gadget, if you think of it in linear algebra terms, is just a exponential of um, uh, a Pauli string. So here you have, for example, um, the exponential of z, i, and z. And uh, if you, it's parameterized by some phase. So if you have pi over four over here, then you're going to get a pi over four over here. So this is a, this is a. Um, this is actually you can think of it as a generalization of a z rotation gate. So a z rotation gate, you you, you apply rotation if you if it's a one if zero then apply rotation. Here you apply rotation if um the the XOR of the legs it acts on, um if, the, if there's an odd number of ones, then it, you apply the rotation. So um this is a diagonal matrix if you write it as a matrix, and um similarly, if you had um just x and i's in your Pauli string. In your, in your exponential, then you will get this very similar but different gate here, and where, where it, it does exactly what I described about the um, operationally, except it does it in the Hadamard basis. So what I described just now, like um, applying the XORs and rotating, that I'm describing what happens as action on the computational basis. Same here, but in the Hadamard basis. So so far so good. Um, so the Z and X phase gadgets are universal. So it turns out you can, for any kind of circuit, you can you can, can apply a generalized n qubit Euler decomposition on these circuits. So any any quantum circuit can be written as a sequence of these green and red phase gadgets. So for example, this is how you write the controlled Z rotation, and and you can tell from from this kind of representation, um, two things. And first of all, that it's symmetric on all three of the qubits. You can see like because these phase gadgets commute with each other. You can tell that it's acting on every single qubit in the and all pairs of qubits and, and then on all three qubits. Um, so you can see that it's symmetric and you also can see from looking at this because it only has green phase gadgets, that is also a diagonal matrix. So, so it's a difference between just writing a gate down in circuit notation versus kind of writing it more operationally here and you see exactly what it's doing. Um, um, so it turns out if you conjugate the, um, the exponential of the a power exponential is equivalent to the exponential of the conjugated, you just exponentiate, you're just conjugating the exponent and then exponentiating it. So, um, this, you can, you can see this by just looking at the Taylor series basically. And, um, below here are some really trivial, um, identities on the, on the, on the of C naught and Pauli strings. Um, so, so, so for example, if you had a. Pauli Z on the one qubit, and then you had C knots on um, on these on these qubits. You get um, you don't do anything because the C knots just pass through and commute and cancel out. But if you had um, Z Z on Z and Z, then you um, you one of the Z's disappear. These are really trivial circuit like identities. But diagrammatically, when you combine these actions on the Pauli's and and the thing I said about exponentials, you're gonna diagrammatically get this. So here's here's the Here's all the ZX you need to know to, to follow this talk. Um, so you look at the space gadget above. Since um, the C not uh, the control bit is a green leg, and then so does the phase gadget. They're going to commute and cancel out the other C not. So the number of legs on this phase gadget doesn't increase or decrease. However, if you flip the C not and you had the target on the on the first qubit, 
um, they don't commute and instead they actually toggle, they actually increase or remove the leg as seen here in the second row. And if you did this again, unsurprisingly, you, you remove that leg. Um, so this is how you, this, this, this is all rewriting you need to know in terms of ZX if you're not someone who is familiar with it. And um, so there's this, and there's exactly the same thing in the Hadamard basis, you just invert every color. Um, so, so. So great, we can, we can now work, so it turns out every, every circuit can be written as a sequence of phase gadgets. And also we know exactly how to rewrite them and so on. Um, if you combine these rewrite rules, if you repeatedly do this, you can, if you read from right to left, you can actually decompose a C naught, uh, decompose a phase gadget into, into a circuit. So as example here, this is a topological, this is, this is a decomposition of a four legged green phase gadget on, on this particular architecture. So, so this is, this is its output in Qiskit. And with some, it's a sequence of C naughts followed by a Z rotation and then some C naughts in reverse order. Um, so, so the, the metric we're interested in, in mainly in this algorithm is to reduce the number of C naughts on, on stuff, because in, in practice, you, you can only apply C naughts on neighboring qubits. And also it's, it's very expensive in the Niskira to apply two qubit gates. gates. So here's an example of a circuit um, that is optimized using these rewrite rules. So you start off with a phase, phase circuit, a circuit with a sequence of phase gadgets like so, and then you apply some C naughts um, from the left, and then you conjugate, you apply the same C naughts in reverse order on the right. And um, you kind of just push, apply those laws by pushing through C naughts. You can think of it as if you had these C, like, each C naught is repeated twice on the left, and you dragged half of them across with those rewrite rules. And it turns out you remove a lot of these legs. And removing legs means less C naughts when you synthesize the phase gadgets in the middle. So you start off with a circuit that would naively require 42 C naughts on a, on a cycle topology to, to decompose. Um, but after this conjugation by C naughts, you only require 14 C naughts in the middle. So that's good. So at the small cost of adding a few C naughts at the beginning at the end, you remove a lot of phase gadgets, a lot of C naughts in the middle. Um, this is this is what it looks like in practice because like it looks in that like, uh, in this circuit model, you can see it looks like there's three layers of C naughts, but that's only because I can't write draw these two C naughts in parallel, right? But um, in practice, this is only depth two, so we're interested in C naught depth as well as C naught count. Here's exactly the same thing, but on a larger circuit. You don't need to understand what it doesn't do anything, this, this circuit. So, so we went from 142 C naughts to 126 on a grid topology. So we can only apply C naughts when it's a neighboring, you know, that's how we count the number of C naughts. Um, another example, so it's the same example, but you show we only applied um, two layers of C naughts. So it turns out when you do conjugation by C naught, layers of C naughts like this, it's actually quite nice for problems if you had if you you had some sort of variation or ansatz of a certain shape and you want to repeat it for multiple layers, because these conjugations are going to just going to cancel out. That's how that's how conjugation works, right? So um, so at the cost of adding a few C naughts at the beginning at the end, you actually remove a lot of C naughts in the middle, just like this. So so now we have this optimization game, right? So you have you, you, someone builds a circuit using these phase gadgets. And now the question is how do, how, what, what sequence of C naughts do you apply at the beginning, at the end, such that the number of legs is minimized. Actually, more specifically, you need to think about the amount, the, how the legs translate to the number of C naughts, uh, because we're, we're architecture aware. So, so this is in simple term, our cost metric. So two times, because you have C naughts in the beginning, at the end, and, and, uh, yeah, L because we repeat L layers. Um, yes, so so how do we optimize this in practice, right? Because this is not a problem you can apply gradient descent to like naively, because this is like, this is not a continuous problem. You either have a C naught or you don't. So we, we apply simulated annealing and all, all simulated annealing is, is, is just, you, you start at some point in your kind of search space and then you, you each iteration, you pick a neighboring and C not configuration, and you you check where it's better. If it's better, you 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 go to the better one. But if it's not as good, you kind of jump depending on how 
how close it is to being good. Basically, you 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 have this kind of you exp you maybe you might go to it, you transition with some probability, and um, this is how the this is the the formula for it. Um, like there's this animation on Wikipedia of it jumping across the minimum, but I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play it. I think. Um, so this is this is just a a graph placeholder so I can talk about. There's a there's an exploration kind of exploitation trade off of like if you if you only explored the points where it's strictly better you're going to miss the global minimum right but if you you went up and then go down you're going to find the global minimum so that that's what this slide is talking about um ah, temperature curves so there's a t here this t stands for temperature so if you think about it if your temp your t is high you're much more likely you're, you're much more likely to explore the um the places the 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 neighbors that are like not as good as your current position so but but that might increase the probability of finding the global minimum. So there's that. Um, we ran this and we we had some results. Um, so what we did was we we um, for each data point we, we we did an average of five circuits. So what we had is we had five repeating layers um, in the benchmarking, and each layer had about you know between ten to thirty five phase gadgets. And um, for each for each phase gadget, um, because we we want to be realistic, we apply two to three legged phase gadgets locally, and then um, we we essentially apply this needing optimization described just before, and um, the result was we we, we removed the last C nodes. Um, so uh, this is a graph. You can tell that the more annealing you do, the more optimization is done. And uh, that's basically it. And then this is actually quite fast in Python. So, so we wrote, wrote, wrote this library in Python, and um, and uh, each each of these uh, each annealing iteration took four hundred to eight hundred um, microseconds. And uh, so each data point took took no more than three seconds to do. And each experiment took no more than three seconds to do in total. And uh, here's the same graph, but we kind of it's a three D graph. So I just switched the colors to X. So in, if you look at this way, the, the the more gadgets there were, the less savings you got like Im immediately. But um, I think it's still it's still not bad. I think. So for future work, we um, so what I've described above is for mixed phase gadgets. So only phase gadgets is in the Z and uh, purely in the Z and purely in the X basis. So like either all green legs or all red legs. But you can actually extend these to Pauli gadgets, and uh, this is when the Pauli string is Z, X, or I, or Y, and so on. And then um, you can it's not just you can cliff it, you can conjugate not just with the C nots but also with any Clifford gate. So this is an alternate way to to frame this framework. And um, we can also potentially uh, try other known techniques that involve phase gadgets into this Pauli ops, ops library that I'll show you in a moment. And then um, one fun thing we could try is do quantum needling, like use quantum needling to do quantum computation. And um, so I'm going to show you some, some quick slides on how this. Library works. It's, it's all online on GitHub. You can pip install it. It's it's got documentation, so you can try it out and contribute to it. It's open sourced, so um, it's really simple. You start with um, you define a phase circuit, so it's just an empty circuit, and then you you just define it as layer by layer. You you define Z Z phase gadgets, X phase gadgets, and you specify which legs you act on. It's 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 very what you see is what you get, and then you have we have topologies of actual machines inside the library, so you, you're doing. You can actually do architecture aware since this. Um, so here's here's a here's a cycle of topology, um, and uh, if you combine the the circuit with a, you pick a topology, you pick a needling schedule, and uh, you specify a few high parameters, and you start optimizing, and at the end you can get uh, ah I went ahead. This is that's that. You can. You can synthesize these phase circuits into actual circuits into Qiskit. So we, we export to Qiskit. And uh, yeah, you can optimize it using the, the I just described. So you less C nots. Um, yeah, so uh, feel free to try it, check it out, use it. Um, I hope, yeah, I hope. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Richie. This is kind of the same, or almost exactly the same problem as the AAS algorithm that Ariana invented two years ago. So how does it compare performance-wise? Um, 
So that's uh, that. That was that. Was, you're talking about the architecture where synthesis of phase polynomials, right? Yeah. That was that was yeah. This is this is essentially like a like a ZNX version of that. So that was only interested in like synthesizing diagonal diagonal things, right? No, not just yeah. And it was this is more this is this is universal. What was that is for phase polynomials specifically? Um, I think I think it compares similarly, but I would be one particular thing from that paper that I'm interested in is like you you, you kind of do apply CNOS in the middle of the circuit and kind of apply these conjugation rules. So I'll, I'll be interested in not just conjugating at the front and at the end, and then maybe somewhere in the middle. Yeah, Ariane, and she's nodding. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So you get the scenes in, in between these layers. So the the thing is that what what Richie is doing is these these little face sketches in the middle. Uh, he is like decomposing them in like a simple, boring way. And I was trying to find very smart ways of doing those. But he's like, well, if I put scenes in the front and scenes in the back, then I don't need the to to do this a smart way in the middle. So uh, on the one hand, you could say that uh, you know there is a trade-off between am I doing this smart or am I doing this stupid, and on the other hand, maybe it might be a nice thing to combine. I don't know, but we're going to talk later, anyways. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's a, it's, it's a, the, your, I think your framework because you're allowed to put things in the middle is strictly when it's strictly better. But then we, we use any. Yeah, and actually, like little shout out, there is another paper from the guys in Paris that uh, uh, that, that 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 already improved all this. Yeah. <laughs> We can put yeah. all of this inside Pavilion, and it's going to yes. be. Thanks. Oh, Alex, that's a good is that a good question? Did you? Oh, hey, thanks, thanks, Richie. Um, well, quick question: Does it talk to physics? Oh, not yet. Not yet. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, that would be cool. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, so so synthesizing these gadgets in the sense of turning them into C naught plus a single qubit phase, mm -hmm. uh, and optimizing sets of gadgets using C naught gates, conjugating with C naught gates, mm -hmm. really seems to be solving the same problem, right? I just want to get as few legs as possible um, on 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 a gadget. Mm -hmm. But if I, I know I can always solve this, you know, I can always take it all the way down to one if I have just a single um, phase gadget in there. Um, so do you think by, by you know, chopping these into smaller, smaller pieces exactly. or something like that, you're, exactly, you, yeah. you can, you can do more? Yeah, exactly. I think chopping in the middle is a good idea. I think, I think that's, that's what, what Ross and Ariane did. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's 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 much better. I just had an this was in a master's thesis, and then I just implemented it, and and now we can, but we can put way more things in it. I think it's a very nice framework to to work with. Yeah. All right. Let's thank uh, Richie again. Hi everybody. I'm Kobinian from LMU Munich. Um, I'm also gonna talk about circuit optimization also about uh, reducing two qubit gates using the zx calculus so our work is mainly based on the graph theoretic simplification paper which i think three authors are here in the audience as well um, so we transform a quantum circuit to a so-called graph-like diagram where we have only those green spiders uh, left, uh, which are connected between themselves via Hadamard wires. And then we try to simplify this diagram as much as possible by eliminating all interior Clifford spiders. Here, um, we apply local complementation, so we can remove this interior spider and the Hadamard connections between the remaining neighbors get toggled, so they get connected if and only if they were not connected before. And we can apply pivoting in a similar fashion, only that we work on pairs of spiders. But it's not so important 
for my talk to exactly understand how these rules work, but um, that they change the amount of remaining Hadamard wires, depending on how we use the rule. And as a last step, we extract the circuit back from the simplified diagram. And this is, as you might recall from John's talk on Monday, an efficient extraction currently is only possible if the diagram admits some kind of flow from MBQC. In this paper, it is a G-flow where we consider every spider being measured in the XY plane of the block sphere. So my work um, is mainly based on the fact that if we use this technique um, to optimize Clifford plus T circuits, so we have many non-Clifford spiders present in the graph-like diagram, um, this sometimes leads to a increased to an increased two qubit gate uh, count of the optimized circuit and this is because um, like i said local complementation and pivoting during diagram simplification often increase the number of hadamard wires and the number of hadamard wires closely corresponds to the number of extracted two qubit gates so this is a particularly extreme example where we um, would in um, the existing approach eliminate this interior Clifford spider by applying local complementation on it. And as you see, the number of Hadamard wires uh, drastically increases in this diagram. And indeed, we have, um, if we extract it with the extraction algorithm, we would have a um, um, high amount of extracted two qubit gates. So, um, my main idea was uh, instead of focusing on reducing every or eliminating every possible Clifford spider in the diagram, why not focus on eliminating uh, the Hadamard wires instead? So I came up um, with the idea on introducing those heuristics. So I select my rules based on how they change the number of Hadamard wires in the diagram. And this then serves me as kind of an heuristic on how the number of two qubit gates of the underlying quantum circuit changes. So in this example, we have two spiders, V1 and V2, uh, where we can apply local complementation on. And my heuristic then would tell me that, yeah, applying local complementation on V1 would increase the amount of Hadamard wires by two whereas applying local complementation on V2 would actually decrease the number of Hadamard wires. And my assumption is then that uh, we should prefer local complementation on V2 because it removes more two qubit gates of the underlying circuit. And based on this, um, I uh, implemented various search algorithms where we can sequentially step through the simplification process um, and apply local complementation or pivoting. So um, the algorithms are very simple. I implemented a greedy search uh, where we always apply the rule with the best heuristic result. And a random search where we simply choose a random rule, but it's not entirely random because we can always specify some kind of lower bound uh, for the heuristic result. So in this example on the right, um, if we say we apply a random search with a lower bound of minus one, we would discard every rule application which increases the diagram by more than two Hadamard wires. And next, I also looked at how we can use local complementation and pivoting on non-Clifford spiders, because that would in some cases also help us to further decrease the Hadamard wire count. And this can be done in the following way. We simply unfuse. Um, so here we want to apply local complementation on the middle interior spider. We unfuse some unwanted part of the face um, upwards, insert an empty spider with two Hadamard wires in order to preserve the graph-like structure of the diagram. And then we can apply local complementation on the remaining spider which ends up in this construct and we have decreased the amount of Hadamard wires. But this has the problem um, 
that we actually generated something here which we cannot uh, consider being uh, measurable in the xy plane anymore this indeed would be a spider measured in xz plane so the pi over two in the middle and um, when extracting a circuit back from this diagram um, we would actually need some additional transformation so we would uh, apply local complementation back on this spider and this would indeed um, again increase the amount of Hadamard wires so that's probably not what we want so I came up with a kind of different technique which I call neighbor unfusion um, because instead of unfusing this unwanted part of the spider upwards we unfuse it towards the direction of a neighbor of the spider and then again we can apply local complementation on this interior spider and we see that we actually further decrease the Hadamard wire count but this also sometimes has the problem that we generate spiders which are not measurable in the xy plane anymore but we found out kind of empirically that um, we maintain every spider in xy measurement plane if um, the uh, original spiders uh, get extracted on the same qubit so the leftmost and the middle spider and um, I think it is um, yeah this is still an interesting and open question what happens um, if those spiders get extracted to different qubits um, do we still preserve some kind of flow so do we preserve g flow or maybe Pauli flow um, Okay, so I implemented all those four algorithms like uh, um, the random and greedy both with and without neighbor unfusion in physics, where I used this pipeline here to evaluate them. So I don't care about T gates, I only care about two qubit gates. That's why before applying my simplification algorithms, I used the phase teleportation algorithm um, which was published in another paper. And I evaluated everything on the TPAR benchmark from Matthew Amy, I think it is. And um, we can see that we, um, yeah, these heuristic algorithms do a fairly good job uh, in reducing both total and two qubit gate count of all those circuits. Um, we actually perform way better um, than if we perform the standard Clifford simplification, especially for the two qubit gates. We also perform better than um, yeah, doing no simplification at all, just the basic optimization and phase teleportation, which is also a result because it means that uh, the graph-like diagram simplification is useful in that scenario. And we also compared the results to yeah one of the i think leading non zx calculus based optimization approaches and we are still outperformed by this approach um, but we managed to further improve the results from the nam et al paper if we after that applied our, our heuristic algorithms on their results um, so to sum up um we improved with our technique um, this graph like diagram simplification both in total and two qubit gate reduction and um we yield we have some kind of the best overall results when we combine this specifically um, two qubit gate reduction with other optimizers like the nam and owl and which i didn't mention the thought algorithm as well could be something and for future work i think um, as you might know um, both greedy and random search are uh, non-optimal greedy search gets stuck in local minima i think it will be useful and further improve our results if we employ some kind of global optimization algorithm and i think um, we could also greatly benefit from further exploiting the neighbor infusion technique. So look at um, how we can insert spiders into a graph-like diagram in order um, to further simplify the diagram. 
So thank you very much. In case we don't have the time to speak, here are my contact details and I'm open for questions. Thanks, Gabinian. Uh, do we have questions? Yeah. Yeah, this is maybe um, more of a comment than a question, but uh, yeah, Tommy and I are working exactly on this question of um, preserving G-Flow under these kinds of unfusion operations. And uh, we've already got some results about that and are hoping to put those um, on the archive sometime in the not too far future. Um, yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah, but it might still be interesting to to discuss a bit more about yeah, sort of what, what exactly it is you need. So yeah, you, you said you're particularly interested in situations where you don't create any phase gadgets everything stays in the xy plane yes exactly. Um, and so That's... um yeah that might be um might be another interesting thing to maybe look at together yeah definitely all right then uh, alex um thanks for the thanks for the talk this is a really nice result i didn't expect expect the extractor ever to be not increasing c naught counts so so that's good um let's see so so do you think so you so you make this restriction of staying in the um in the good plane i always forget which one's the good one yeah, but XY, you know yeah. yeah xy um because because you need to do a local complementation um not only to, local to, to, yeah. to get sort of to get right back to, to get back to the correct plane not only local complementation yeah actually um when pivot, extracting a phase gadget um you need pivoting as well yeah. yeah um do you think there's a way to avoid doing that um just just maybe in, in rethinking how how this extraction phase goes or or I I've not so much looked into the extraction process. It was rather like the black box. It was the, the I see. Thing. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 but it would the... be great actually if we could somehow prevent this well, okay. because I think using phase gadgets and simplification is something great. And it turns mm -hmm. out that just circuit extraction with phase gadgets is increases C knots. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, because we were we were looking at something similar using some simulated annealing stuff to figure out basically doing local complementations but without deleting nodes. Yeah. To see if this helps your extraction, but but it but it doesn't because the extractor just undoes all the, all yes, the local exactly. complementations that you did. I think did. it's also so, implemented in physics, right? The, the uh, thing you're could, talking it could about. Be, yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, so this time I do have a question. Uh, so have you thought at all about what the landscape of kind of the number of H uh, edges looks like under these local complementations? Because it seems like it wouldn't be terribly smooth, right? Because you, you will, like, if you've got lots of edges already and you do a local complementation, then you go to very few. So like, yeah, how does that affect the idea of like, yeah, trying to do this globally, more globally rather than in a greedy process? Um. I'm not sure if I understand your question. How you? What do you mean by landscape? Uh, so, so if if you think of kind of um, uh, like you you have a function of your diagram which which gives you how many h edges you have, and then maybe diagrams are kind of considered to be adjacent to each other if they're related by a single local complementation. Um, then I would expect as you kind of move through this process of local complementations, the number of h edges will kind of jump up and down. It won't yes. kind of yeah yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, so so. I, that that seems to me that like this sort of greedy approach um, seems a bit unintuitive, um, and on the other hand, it makes it hard to really figure out how you would do a global um, optimization. Yes. Have you? Yeah. yeah. Do you have any thoughts on on how to go about this? Actually, it, it turned out to be a quite complicated problem because I tried to somehow implement simulated annealing as well, um, but. I'm not sure, but I think if you change you change your whole search space by every rule application, and um, that's kind of very difficult thing to handle. And I didn't come up with a solution yet, but it it would be great 
to have some kind of global optimization algorithm. That's why I put it here. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Thanks. This is a this is very cool stuff. But this is a comment to the comment because my my PhD student Kiriakos is working on a very similar thing in the context of reducing the max degree of a graph state. Mm -hmm. So he's doing local complementation and pivoting, and even doing one step of look ahead in your greedy search can give enormous improvements. Okay. Yeah. If I was going to suggest what you should do for a better algorithm, I would say Monte Carlo tree search. Okay. Right. Thanks. So. <laughs> All right, and with that, let's uh, let's thank uh, Covinian one more time. Yeah.